presented by Historic Redeemer Lutheran Church in Elmhurst, Illinois. The Old Testament reading for the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany is from Isaiah chapter 58. Why have we fasted, and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure, and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight, and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. <clears throat> Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast, and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and to bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Praise the Lord, all nations. For great is his steadfast love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come to his voice. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, 
even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person, which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And this we impart in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord, so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever lacks, relaxes one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. See it not only in their words, 
and in their love for preaching Christ. Today's Gospel, for the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany, is a, a well-known, the well-known words preached by Jesus Christ. He opened his mouth and preached. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. In a sense, it was this first sermon, at least the first sermon recorded in Matthew. So when did Jesus preach these words? Where was he? Who was he talking to when he said, you are the salt, you are the light? Like I said, it was at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He was up north by the Sea of Galilee. And while it was probably not Jesus' first sermon, it was the first sermon recorded in Matthew. So we're waiting to hear what the Messiah says. You like to hear things when you come to church. You like to hear things read and preached, but when Jesus opens his mouth, you want to want to listen carefully. Those who followed Jesus who went to hear this famous rabbi, they could see him coming. They, they probably they knew this was going to be something great. They waited. What is he going to say? What will he say to us? So in a sense, this is a very significant sermon. And in, in a sense, it's, it's the first sermon he preaches. So, the opening words from Jesus are, Blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What did he mean by that? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Well, you recognize these as the, the opening words of the Beatitudes, which were last Sunday's Gospel reading. We get to the point. The poor in spirit are those who have repented of their sins. In Matthew 4, 17, the narrative explains, From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the summary of his sermons. He had such things as sermon titles back in those days. It would probably be at the top of Every, every bullet of that, that they repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. At hand. I like that idiom. At hand. It's almost like you could reach out and, and touch it. At hand. When, when we pray the Lord's Prayer today, uh, I don't know if you close your eyes, but try this today. Uh, Open your eyes. Look up at the altar. Look at the altar and at every petition. Think, how is the Lord's Prayer about that? Thy kingdom come. Reach out your hand. It's at hand. Then the First words of Jesus' sermon. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It's not saying, go get it. There's enough good works to make it happen. It, you've repented. The kingdom of God is yours. So in today's text, Matthew 5, 13 and following, he begins, or actually continues that sermon after the Beatitudes. Saying, oh, by the way, you're blessed. I'm talking to the blessed here. <laughs> Who are the you? Well, the first disciples, uh, first the disciples he's speaking to, because the previous text explains, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. So you have the crowds, they're in the pool. Then his disciples came up to him. And then right away, Jesus told his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. Okay, in the first sense, they are the salt. And what is the purpose of salt? Well, to season and to preserve. 
your seasoning, you don't need too much salt. You just need to sprinkle it on just, just, just right. You might use a lot more to preserve it, something. Well, in Romans 8, Paul says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childhood until now. Because of the fall of the sin, the world is just groaning, the whole world. There's nowhere to get away from it. I remember there was times when things were kind of going crazy, and I thought, where can I get away? Maybe it was still during the Cold War. Where can I go? Uh, we lived in Africa. I thought I was safe there. You know, the big bombs started falling down. And then we came back to America. Um, I found this little island off the coast of Argentina, the Malvinas, whatever the other name is. And I'll go down there. Safe. Right after that, England attacked the Malvinas. Maybe I'll go back to Norway where my relatives came from. There is nowhere you can go. You just stay where you're at. Put yourself in God's hands and you live there. The whole creation is groaning everywhere because of sin. But then Paul says, in Christ, in Him, the whole creation, the whole creation itself, will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. This, this messed up world in which we live is decaying. And you know what happens. If you don't preserve it, it's going to just turn more and more rancid. So it needs to be preserved. It's even in the last sometime. We understand this passage from first-hand experience. We see it before us in our, the cultural wars today. There was a time you could go to some Malvinas Island or go up in the mountains and kind of get away from it. It's still warring inside you. You can't get away with it. The monks in the desert thought, oh, we can get away from this. We will need to be there and get away from the world. And then like, some wise men Monks would say, this is dangerous. Because if you, you're by yourself, the war, the war works even more harshly there. But we understand this passage about the decaying world of first-hand experience. We see our culture today being ripped apart. Our nation, uh, we see the world in this amazing, I shouldn't say unexpected, but at least at this, to this point, a cultural war, the confusion of male and female, of marriage and gender, the increasing intolerance of those who want to uphold the beautiful gift of God, marriage of male and female. I just kind of go home and read the second half of Romans 1 and you find out it's not that unusual. Cultures have been playing these games since the time of Paul. This isn't just an American thing. It's happening all over the world. The reason I'm here today is I spoke about the International Youth Council downstairs. And I'm here as part of a, the International Youth Council. It's meeting, the board is meeting here. And we had a, a, a grand event last night with, with uh, wine and cheese and then a lecture. Finnish bishop who's being persecuted uh, in Finland, taken to court, threatened with uh, fines and jail because of simply upholding that male and female God created. He and along with this other woman doctor and lady in Parliament. Uh, well, that's just an example of the many, of the seven million people in, in the 60 churches of the, of the International Movement Council around the world who are being persecuted for righteousness sake. But also, and I could stand here like in Bible class, I said, I could just come here and just weave a story and you're thinking you're li listening to the evening news. <laughs> I could get you so depressed, right? It doesn't take much. I, I, I got to change the station. The last man standing needs to be a Hurt up a bit after that. Uh, but what would that do? Well, it's, it, it's there, we know it. But 
into this darkness, there's got to be light somewhere. Of course, of course there is. You know where it is. There's got to be salt somewhere to preserve this world. Uh, what is salt for? Jesus said you are the salt of the earth. Well, salt is to sprinkle on, make edible, but it's also preserve. Light and salt shine forth from here, and they also shine forth all around the world in the churches in the international and the council and countless other churches about the world where Christ is proclaimed. And it's first of all to the apostles that Jesus was saying, you are the light of the world, you're the salt. I'm sending you into this world. This doesn't want to hear what you have to say. And then most of you will be killed, uh, persecuted. But I'm sending you because you're the salt. You are the light of this darkness needs. And they went. You are the light of the world. Without light, I can imagine living without light. You hear stories about those young men in Indonesia or somewhere in the cave where they were caught down and they had to be rescued. Imagine being days, maybe weeks, out of the light. Without light, though, everything eventually dies. So with darkness comes death. Without light, you'll just stumble around in the darkness. you have no hope. You'll be filled with anxiety and fear and despair. A couple of months ago, it's a little longer now, my wife and I visited friends in Michigan and they, they got us tickets to a, a play. The, the, the title was Witches, not the book. They don't pick this wrong. But they had witches because it was a play about the Middle Ages and about this family, a wealthy family that lived in a castle of sorts. And, uh, they had money, they had servants, they had wealth, they had good clothes, they had all good food. And the servants dutifully did what servants do waiting on them. They, it was great. And then things started falling apart. I can remember right, the wife, the lord of the castle died. And then uh, the marriage of his son and somebody else started to fall apart. Then the other son committed suicide. And uh, when you get the point, I left feeling depressed. But I also, somewhere in watching the film, the, uh, the play, or afterwards, I, I realized that, that wasn't a play about the Middle Ages. It's, it's a newly written play. That's about today. They started thinking it through about our culture today, where people are at, and how giving up, every, taking all the gifts of God, marriage, family, and everything else, uh, and rejecting it, you ultimately get to the point where there's no hope turns to dis despair, hopelessness. Much of our culture is in this, why is there so much suicide? Well, I'm not a professor, you know, psychologist, I haven't tested that either, but why this violence and this murder and this, this nihilism and this craziness without hope? Imagine, I, that play gave me a glimpse into what many people are living with. And if I hadn't seen that plan, I wouldn't have got so all this because it's not what I live with. Not because I'm blessed, because I'm better than anyone else. I just I'm blessed. I'm blessed because I was baptized and my parents told me about Jesus and brought me to church and raised me with the gifts. So I'm blessed. And uh, we all have disappointments in life, big disappointments of all kinds, but we have hope. And uh, I got up Sunday morning, we went to church, and keep thinking about hopelessness of so many in our world. And I sat, uh, sat over this section over here, my wife was on my right, and Judy Baskin on the left, and Bob. <laughs> we sang the opening hymn. Oh, wasn't that uh, the Word of God hymn we just sang? Fantastic. That doesn't fill you with hope. Nice, strong word. We sang it over again. Yeah. The pastor absolved our sins. And then I think it was our field worker or something. The priest it. No, it was a vicar preached a good sermon. And at the end of that, we sang again. And it just kind of struck me. Uh, and I turned to Judy and, and 
then I turned to Annette and told them both, uh, I just filled with hope. Since we walked into this church, it's been pouring into us, and any hope that was sucked out of us this night before contemplating a world of hopelessness, uh, it was like, oh, I, I got it back. And then, of course, uh, a lot of times, it happens every Sunday. These gifts, this, this hope is poured back into you when you notice it, when you think about it a lot, or when you don't. And while we all have our fears and our anxieties, we have a hope that doesn't, doesn't disappoint. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You are the poor in spirit because you have repented of your sins. That's the way Jesus has summarized all of his preaching. As this earth decays and groans, yours is the kingdom of God. You shall be comforted. You are blessed. You shall be comforted when you mourn. You shall inherit the earth. You shall be satisfied. You have received mercy. You shall see God. How's that one? I don't mean just see him through the faith that comes through here. You shall see God. And that brings it together. So rejoice and be glad. I don't know what despair or sadness some of you might have been going through, but Jesus said, You're you, you people here, you are the light, you are the salt. So rejoice and be glad, because the salt, Jesus Christ, the gospel, is death and resurrection, fills your life. It fills your life in this place. You always carry the salt and light with you when you leave. When you go into the world today to live another week out there, you are God's baptized children. You are His forgiven children. And you bring the light of Christ with you. In fact, Jesus says, you are the light through which I shine to others. You are the salt. It can be tough out there, you don't need me to tell you that. But the light of Christ is with you always. Oh, the last word. The church of age side has to be again. Rejoice and be glad. In the name of Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.